Hello everyone and welcome. Our presenter today, Mark Grady, is a 6,000 hour pilot. He's also a commercial pilot. He's a speaker, a writer, a humorist, and he goes around the country delivering AOPA safety seminars as well. Mark has a good program for you, so if you positioned yourself near the back door to escape, you probably won't have to use that strategy today. Please welcome your presenter, Mark Grady. safety seminars as well. Also the FA production studio crew. You may not know this, but this studio crew here is volunteering. Uh, folks are at home watching on the World Wide Web. Welcome to you if you're at home and watching on the internet for the safety program. Wish you were here. It's a great uh, opportunity for you to go ahead and, and uh, take a look at what's going on all over the country uh, here at the FA production studios. All of these are volunteers that are working here from the control room upstairs and folks who are streaming to all the camera operators. Let's give them a big hand for what they do here at the FA television studios. We really do appreciate that. Also, uh, AOPA, how many AOPA members we got in here? Well, great, uh, man, that's a majority crowd, I'd say. Well, AOPA uh, puts out all kinds of services that you see on the screen now. I'm from the AOPA Air Safety Foundation, which was founded in 1950 as a charitable foundation. Do all kinds of great work, including safety seminars like this one, the pinch hitter courses you've heard about, safety advisors, instructor reports. We do the weekend flight instructor refresher clinics all over the country. Also put out some very valuable publications, including the Null Report and some type-specific safety reports as well. My name is Mark Grady. She said I had 6,000 hours. What Kathleen is always reluctant to tell everybody is those 6,000 hours were primarily in a Cessna 152. So folks usually look at me and have some great responses. My two favorite are uh, this fellow who's a safety seminar heckler in Rochester, New York. Always hollers out and he has something to say every time I'm up there. But this last time I was in the Rochester, New York area, he said, hey, 6,000 hours in 152? And I said, yeah. He said, was that before or after your check ride? <laughs> and I said, that's all right. I said, we're really, you know, funny. We, I'm from North Carolina. We have a good sense of humor. I did arrange for him to be ramp checked the next day, but that's <laughs> one of the advantages of, of having friends at the FAA, so that's a lot of fun. Hey, one of the neat things, another guy told me at one of our weekend flight instructor refresher courses, two very seasoned aviators. They didn't know I was behind them trying to get out in the hall during a break, and they were talking about, and I heard one say, did that guy say he had $6,000 and a 152? The other one said, yeah, he did, and he said, that boy ain't got no ambition. But I thought that was a, a great one, too. Most of that time was during a 10 years as an airborne traffic watch pilot and reporter for uh, two radio stations and a TV station in Raleigh, North Carolina. And that was the end of a 22-year broadcast career. I used to do talk radio and um, used to write and produce TV commercials. And I did actually two years on television like this until the consultants came to town and said I had a, um, a face for radio, so they took me off the uh, television, put me on the radio. Hey, one of the neat things about being a broadcast pilot, and those of you who've seen me do a program before, you've seen this, but somebody asked me today, do show that again, so I will. I got the chance to fly some really unique flying machines because these companies would come to town and they'd give me free instruction on these really neat aircraft, and then they'd want me to, you know, talk about their company on the, on the air. So I, I would do that, and I got to fly a very limited aerobatic routine with the Red Baron Stearman crew. Have you seen those? That, boy, that's a lot of fun. I fell in love with the Stearman after that. And then um, it's just really neat. And that, But the flying machine that just changed my life was this one. And if you haven't ever seen this before, anybody know type aircraft? Hey, I have quite a bit of PIC time in the Blockbuster Video Blimp. How about that? How did this change my life? Dealing with air traffic controllers. I, for the, at my size, I don't have a sense of power often but I did in this thing. Because I told air traffic controllers, y'all better start being nice to me or I'll come back and shoot an ILS in this thing. <laughs> it takes uh, 45 minutes to shoot a full ILS in the blockbuster video blimp. 
I was up in Chicago doing a nightly seminar, and one of the guys hollered out in the audience, he said, hey, why didn't you borrow that for this seminar run and ask to shoot an approach into O'Hare? And I said, good grief, why would I want to do that? He said, because when they got to fussing at you, you could have said, hey, if Meg's was open, I could have gone into there. <laughs> Those guys were thinking up there in Chicago, weren't they? I know our AOPA Southeastern rep, Bob Mentor, who's in the audience, appreciates that. He's working to protect some of our fields and what's going on in flying in, in uh, their neck of the woods as well. He's sitting beside my wife, so be nice, Bob, all right? All right, we're here to talk today about single pilot IFR operations. Let me clarify something. I know how pilots are. You have to clarify everything. This is single pilot interested uh, in instrument flight rules. Single pilot. We get some people show up this thing and say, single pilot IFR, what is that? Is it single pilot interested in finding romance? And they think they're going to meet somebody here. So you just want to clarify that right from the start, that this is what this is all about. And I want to ask you a question right from the start. Is a single pilot IFR operation safe? What do you think? What's the best answer? I hear yes, a very definitive yes. A couple people say, well, what is the best answer? It all depends on who. You, the person that's flying the aircraft. And before we get started, IFR has to do with the weather primarily, doesn't it? You know, in the early days of instrument flight work, General Jimmy Doolittle up in Virginia was instrumental in helping work on instrument flight. You talk about partial panel flying. That's what these folks were doing when they were setting up instrument flight. So since weather is involved, let's talk about a couple of things here and get a few facts to you. Weather is responsible for more than 25% of all accidents in general aviation. Now, I don't necessarily, although this is official wording, like the way this is worded because it gives you the impression that weather is coming down and it's just slapping these uh, pilots and getting them in trouble coming out of the sky. Could it be some aeronautical decision-making involved in this as well? Unfortunately, these numbers get a little worse. 30% of weather accidents happen to be fatal. How about that? And look at this. This may surprise you. 43% of pilots involved in weather accidents are instrument rated. Now, I see that pilot logic going off. You're thinking, well, naturally it is, because of the fact that if they're guys that are up there flying in the weather, but if you look at the accident reports, you'll see the instrument pilots are just as capable at suffering from things like uh, spatial disorientation is pilots who are not instrument rated. So there are things that can come and bite us whether we're instrument rated or not. In this crowd, we, for those of you watching at home on the internet, we have a studio audience here at the FA Productions uh, studio here. Of the folks here in the audience, how many of you have an instrument rating? That's right. Anybody in here currently working on their instrument rating? A couple of you. Anybody in here interested in getting an instrument rating but you're broke? The rest of you. I see a couple of you are interested in that too. Well, the good news is this. Despite the statistics, Many single pilot IFR flights are made safely every single day. So the key is how can we make those statistics come down and get a little bit better? Because when you start comparing those numbers to what happens in the airlines, our statistics in general aviation aren't quite as good. So how can we make those numbers better and that's why we're here. So the answer to the question should not be is it safe, but how can I be safer as a single pilot who is up there flying in instrument conditions, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So what we're going, the way we're going to do this is we're going to give you, hopefully, what's determined to be seven keys that will make us safer during single pilot IFR operations. And because we're up there flying around, we're busy, aren't we? Look at your job description as a single pilot IFR operator. You're the cabin attendant, the tour guide, the communicator, the pilot in command, the navigator, sometimes even a zookeeper on board some, some aircraft. Of course, the number one list of that job, you know, we're going to put that in correct order here in a minute. The zookeeper, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, some guy sent me, I don't know the whole story behind this uh, picture here, but some of you have seen this thing. Imagine being the first officer on this little regional carrier and the captain telling you, go pre-fly. What would you do? See what kind of aeronautical decision making you would uh, put into play on this thing. But getting back to that, we are busy. And it's, it goes back to that famous aviation line. They even used it in the movie Apollo 13. The aviation is, you know, 15 hours of pure boredom followed by 30 seconds of pure terror. And that can happen to us in an IFR operation. So one of the keys we've got to remember is, number one, prioritize. Put the proper things that we're doing in the proper order. So let's go back to all of these jobs we've got to do in the airplane and 
put this in the correct order by only, number one, putting our number one job up there, and that's what? Pilot command, flying the aircraft, absolutely. Doesn't change whether you're VFR, IFR, it's being the pilot command is our number one job. And we can take some lessons from the guys who fly the heavy iron when it comes to instrument flight, and that is the amount of training that's required. The proficiency level is higher with the airlines because they're always flying uh, consistently in the system, and if we don't always have a chance to do that, especially if we're kind of a weekend operator in aviation, we don't get a chance to stay as proficient as possible. So the number two key after prioritizing is good training. Now, I didn't say just training, but good training. And good training pays off, folks. You know, one of my buddies is still in the television news business, flies one of the news helicopters. They're trying to find out there was a big police chase going on. The cops are trying to pull that blue car. You talk about good training, even though this is the bad guy, I wonder who his driver's ed instructor is, all right? Just a good old boy, never meaning no harm. Beats all you never saw, been in trouble with the law since the day they was born. Straightening the curves, flattening the hills. Someday the mountain might get them, but the law never will. Making their way. Just a little bit more than the law will allow. Just a good old boy. They wouldn't change if they could. Fighting the system like a two modern day Robin Hood. <laughs> Do you know how they finally caught this guy? It was a trucker listening to the radio who heard a traffic reporter talking about this, and he was able to block the road till the cops got there. Talk about good training. I don't know who this guy got it from, but it was incredible. So let's talk about the right stuff when it comes to good training and becoming a more proficient, or even your initial training for, the, the, uh, for your instrument rating. This is where we encourage you. We, we certainly know there's, when you go to a flight instructor, even if they're newly certificated, a lot of those folks know that those maneuvers very well. But when it comes to getting your instrument rating, it'd probably be good to find an instructor who's had some experience flying a lot in the IFR system. It's a whole different world, isn't it? It's different. And so we encourage you to find somebody with experience, somebody that's dedicated. One of the complaints that we hear uh, occasionally about the instructor community is sadly the turnover's high. These guys can go get a job and get paid, and that's sad, isn't it, the way the system works. The most valuable tool in aviation safety, the instructor, seems to be usually the ones who's receiving the lowest amount of compensation for that, and that's sad. We have any CFIs in the audience here? Oh, wow. Let's give them a hand. That's the most underrated job in America, I'll tell you that. Look what they do. They get an airplane with us. And sometimes they don't even know us well, you know, and take that risk. And they do all that just for $112,000 a year. So I don't know if I would, if I would do that. <laughs> and then they train. Here's one thing that's important. You want to train in actual IMC conditions. I can't, I'm amazed. I met a couple of pilots in North Carolina, one out in Arizona, who got an instrument rating and never has been in the clouds. Never. And it's different, isn't it? So you got to do that. I love one of our ins former instructors at the Air Safety Foundation who's now up in Alaska now working up there. But I used to love the way he introduced people, his students, to instrument flying. He'd keep them under the hood no matter what. And then when the first day they actually got in the clouds, he would let them be flying for a little bit before he took the hook off because you see what he was doing, building confidence. When he took the hook off, I'm really doing this. He said he had one big country fellow on board the airplane with him one day and he did it the same way. Got in the clouds, had the hood on after he was there for a little while. He said, take your hood off. So that big fellow took the hood off and there in the clouds. He's flying along. About two minutes later, he turned to the instructor and said, can I put the hood back on now? <laughs> he liked it better when he couldn't see. See, so, you know, it is different. You want to make sure you're training in IMC condition. You can tell whether it's physically put before you that somebody's doing that building block system and training in the IMC system and the IFR system. That's a good thing to look for as well. Simulation's good. Now, 
And I've talked a lot, if you've seen me do a GPS seminar about being concerned about over-dependence on technology, well, this is where technology can help. Even these desktop simulation programs, Microsoft Flight Simulator, even though you might not can officially log some of them, to sit there and go practice approaches and know how the system works with that technology is good to integrate it into your training. Just don't overly depend on that respect as well. So another thing is just time. That helps to be in the air. And that's why a good IFR pilot in our key number three here, maintains proficiency. Even if you're not flying IFR all the time or don't get the chance to, just flying VFR is helping you with your proficiency. Because think about that. If you're comfortable in flying the airplane and operating the controls when you fly, you're not going to have as much more difficult time in putting those skills to use if things are going south on you or you've got a really tough weather system you're having to fly around. So maintaining proficiency is extremely important. And that's where, going back to this technology can come in handy, these uh, computer-based, even official ones that you can actually log a certain amount of time in can help. But maintaining proficiency is extremely important. And going back to that proficient IFR pilot, let's talk about that for just a minute. This is someone that after you get your training or go back for training is someone who regularly practices in IMC conditions. The more comfortable you are, the more you do something, the better you are at it. And that happens all the time. You start a new job, you feel a little confused at first, but after a couple of weeks of being on the job, you're comfortable with it and the procedures and making it work. Proficient IFR pilot, as we mentioned, flies regularly. You're staying in the airplane as much as you possibly can so that you're comfortable in flying it. Here's a big one. Now, I know what the rules say, but sometimes the rules are different from reality, and there's a difference between legal versus safe, isn't it? The rules say that you go out every six months, shoot six approaches, and do a holding procedure, and, uh, you know, as long as you're flying and intercepting the course, you're okay to legally go fly IFR. But you know as well as I do, folks, that if you go out there and you shoot the same six approaches, same six airports every six months, you may be legal. But are you really proficient? If you're someone who's not regularly challenged by flying in the, in the instrument system, instrument flight system in this country, then please get with one of these great instructors that raise your, their hand and get an instrument proficiency check instead of doing that, that uh, six-month uh, just meet the minimum rule requirements. That's not the way to go. Guarantee it. So please be careful when you're out there flying and, and keep that in mind that it's better to challenge yourself. In our emergency seminar we held just a little earlier, we mentioned the fact that in a full-blown emergency, you're going to react the way that you're trained. And that is especially important in the IMC world, especially when we show you a real IFR emergency in a little bit and see how that training works. Another good proficiency is soul searching. You want to be a great pilot, there's a couple of things to put into practice. We mentioned this on our Tuesday, um, uh, seminar on Thursday rather as well, and this is important to note. It doesn't matter, folks, how many hours we've got in our logbook, how many years we've been flying, how many different types of aircraft we've been flying. The bottom line is we're all human and capable of making mistakes. That's one thing, aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that if we really want to be a good pilot, we have to recognize our limitations. Well, as I remember the old uh, Dirty Harry movies, a man's got to know his limitations, and that's true. And so a good, proficient IFR pilot does frequent soul searching, sit down and determine what are my, my weak areas, so that when you go to do that IPC instrument proficiency check, or you go for your flight review, you have the opportunity to really study up on those things and work on them and tell those instructors where your weak areas are. Let's go to another key, and this one happens to be stay organized. It's amazing how over-dependent on technology this messes with us. With all those frequencies and material we need to know on the GPS, we might have all of our flight material kind of laying around inside the airplane where we can't access it. And I'll tell you, this can get us in trouble. Just having access to the information without looking it over before we fly can bite us, folks. We've got to stay organized and know where this material is to access it. If you lose the GPS in flight, knowing how to get to those approach flakes or those frequencies are extremely important. And I'm guilty of this. Go back to the uh, Blockbuster Video Blimp. Look on top of the instrument panel here, and what a mess I've got. 
you know, there was a, a chart. There's a little clipboard over on the left-hand side with the sponsors I had to recognize in and, and doing traffic reports that day. Now, I will, you know, is this good co cockpit resource management? Maybe not. Now, let me defend myself a little bit. It's not like in the airship, the Blockbuster Video Blimp, that you're going to take an abrupt maneuver and four or five Gs are going to throw all that stuff off of the, the top of the instrument panel. It's not going to happen. But in most aircraft, it can be a factor if we're not well organized. So check your flight bag and make sure you got everything you need for the flight. A lot of times pilots are really prepared, but they're not prepared for everything. I remember in North Carolina, we had North Carolina Wings weekend there. And I had a fellow come up. He was a dentist, and he had bought him a 182 and learned to fly in it. He was an excitable fellow. He had a whole stack of um, yellow pads he'd bring to the seminars, and he'd make notes. And after I did one on survival, if you have an off-airport landing one time, he came up and said, I've been thinking about a lot of things you said. I need to go get a new flight bag, new stuff. And he had showed me all these notes he made. And he said, in fact, I'm going to do that right now. And then he told me, hey, I know I'm, you know, I'm flying with an instructor here this weekend. I want you to keep an eye on me when I'm out there. If you see me do anything you know, that, that may get me in trouble, please let me know. I want to be good. And I said, yes, sir, I'm sure you'll be fine, but I'll keep an eye on it. He left the field, and he came back. And he tracked me down. I was taking a break just looking at some planes in the flight line. And he said, check out my bag. And he dropped this new flight bag he brought. I couldn't even pick the thing up. He had bought every single flashlight ever made and put in there. Pilots love flashlights, don't they? But I, I know we do. We keep the flashlight industry in business. The problem is we forget the definition of a flashlight, don't we? That uh, plastic or metal cylinder for the storage of dead batteries. So please remember that and keep all that stuff up to date. But this guy came in there. He had beef jerky. He had bought one of those NASA blank, aluminum foil blankets. And, and he had gone out in the field and found an avionics shop and bought him a handheld radio. He put all that stuff in there. He said, isn't that great? And I said, you've done well. He said, thanks. He grabbed that stuff and walked off to his airplane. What did he put it? Back in the luggage compartment. And when he came back from flying that little phase of the wings program, I saw him, I said, now, now, now you told me, don't get mad, but you told me if I saw you do, he, he interrupted, I got about that much, I said, what did I do? And I said, all that great stuff you got in that bag, and where'd you put it? He went, oh man, he said, I didn't realize, then you're right, and I said, I'm not trying to pick on you, and I just made the point, I said, unless you're built like me, you can't stand up in 182 and walk back there and get that stuff, I can, but most normal people can't. So remember that and keep your check on all that kind of stuff. Another key is this, fly well-maintained equipment. I'm real fortunate. I, my, my bride is, a, is an aircraft mechanic in addition to being a CFI. And I know, you know, if you flew something cheese in, I know it's safe. And that's important to know, especially if you're flying rental aircraft. Most AMTs in this country do a great job. But know these things. You'll be surprised how many pilots will show up for check rides today. And the aircraft, especially with all this equipment coming out, radios coming out, new GPS going in, and even the weight and balance in the aircraft isn't correct, isn't accurate. So know the equipment you're flying. That makes a big difference in you safely completing a flight, especially one that's going in the clouds. So you want to make sure it's, it's something that you're comfortable when you're flying around. Another key here. Let's go to another one. Key number six is this. Maintain weather knowledge. And this is important. The more you know about the weather, Mark Twain said everybody talks about the weather, nobody ever does anything about it. But we kind of changed that as pilots haven't. Yeah, we do. We make decisions based on the weather. And knowing the more you know about how weather systems work, especially locally, the better you are at making decisions about whether you're, even with an instrument rating, whether it's safe to penetrate that particular cloud. There's all kinds of forecasting systems. Some of you may have seen some of these signs around. This is an official NOAA sign, and that the stone is wet, rain, stone gone. I like the last one, tornado. How many of you ever seen a Wyoming windsock? If you've never seen one, here's one of those. <laughs> so if you're ever out in Wyoming and looking for the windsock, they, they are painting them orange so they'll more match now, but that's what, what one looks like. So keep in mind, the more you know about the weather, the safer we are. Key number seven, here's another one, prepare for real emergencies. Now, I told you several times this week, if you've been to any other seminars we've done, I keep emphasizing this because it's that repetitive thing I hope gets through to you. In a real emergency, we're going to react how? The way we're trained, right? And that's why preparation is extremely key. 
You know, knowing that, knowing that is very important. And this is where we're coming up to a really kind of serious but scary part to this seminar. You see these instruments? Folks, when these things fail, it's not good news in single pilot IFR operations. Vacuum pump failure is a dangerous situation in most general aviation airplanes. As a matter of fact, over a 15 year period in general aviation, 80% of vacuum failure, single pilot, IMC operation vacuum failure incidents ended up being fatal. 80%. So what does that tell you? In a single pilot IFR operation, if your vacuum pumps fail, statistically, we're going to die. How can we, and yet what's amazing, when we get through here, you are going to be surprised, amazingly surprised, and how simple the solution is to bring this accident rate down substantially. You know what? Um, it's kind of scary. What I want to do here is show you an actual IFR emergency. This is air traffic control communications tape. This happened near Albuquerque, New Mexico. It is interesting to watch pilots who've never heard this incident before, this tape, react to air traffic control's handling of the situation because most people seem to be a little critical of ATC. When we get back to this, we're going to make things show you that everybody involved in this accident goofed up. This is one of those sad scenarios in aviation where everything that could go wrong did go wrong in this particular situation. Now, pilots are detailed folks. And I found that every time I showed this and didn't tell you this, somebody will come up and ask this question. Has this tape been edited? Yes but only to this extent. It has been edited that if there's ATC communications with other pilots not involved in the incident, that's taken away. And if there's long periods of time of without communication with this pilot, naturally that's edited out as well. But what you're about to see is real, and when you hear the outcome, it will send a chill down your spine. Let's go and watch this action. And it's transcribed on the screen in case you're having trouble hearing the ATC communication. Let's watch and learn from this. November 7, 9, November Lima, verify your level at 230, showing you 400 feet low. Uh, 9, November Lima, we've just figured out that we've had a dual vacuum pump failure. We, uh, we've lost both our vacuum pumps. Uh, so we're going to need to look for uh, the vacuum pump failure. We've got electric uh, backup systems here, but we uh, are having a little trouble holding down. Uh, November 7, 9, November Lima, verify your level at 230. Lima, 
November 7, 9, November Lima, Albuquerque. No survivors on board that aircraft. Let's talk about what happened. Before we get real specific about the Albuquerque incident, let's get some generic stuff about this kind of emergency and see if we can make us a little bit safer. This concerned us so much at the Air Safety Foundation. A study was conducted about this particular type of scenario. Brought pilots in, here's how it worked. Two dozen proficient IFR pilots in 210 and 28 simulators at flight safety. Didn't tell us specifically what we were looking for. Wanted to make it a semi-blind study, didn't we? And then we failed the vacuum pumps on it, and we got the engineers to help out in a way where it wasn't, it was, you know, vacuum pump failure. You've had it happen to you? Insidious, isn't it? There's still pressure in the line. It takes a little while for that to spool down. So it's a slow process, but they made it realistic. Most pilots in the simulator recognized it, and it took them an average of a minute and 42 seconds after vacuum failure. A lot of time, but significant to note that none of those pilots lost their control of the aircraft during that time. But here's where it becomes good news, bad news. The good news is 90% of the pilots in that study recognized the problem, identified it to the simulator instructor. But of those 90% of the pilots who participated in that and knew what was going on, 50% of them ended up crashing in the simulator. Now this brings some questions, doesn't it? Number one question is, and as for all the AMTs like my bride, is what are the chances of vacuum pump failure? Good way to look at it is 100%, isn't it? Yeah. Another question, though, from the pilot perspective is this. Is based on these statistics that you've seen here today and the outcome of situations that are similar to Albuquerque's, do you believe that our current partial panel training is adequate? How many of you say, obviously not? Raise your hand. How many of you still have questions about that? Raise your hand. I'm telling you, I saw one couple of you raise your hand. You know what? You're probably right, and I'll tell you why. Those of you who are instrument rated in this room, when you were simulating the failure of your vacuum pumps in that aircraft and went partial panel, did you lose control of the airplane? No, you did not. So what's happening? Folks, is putting the practice of training into reality that can save our life. Now, this is going to be so simple. Most of you are not going to want to believe that this is the answer, but please listen to me, and let me tell you, it is. If you want to substantially increase your chances of surviving a vacuum pump failure in a single pilot IFR operation in IMC conditions, here's the way you do it. Do what your instructor did and cover up the instruments that are not working. It's as simple as that. Well, all this information coming at us that's confusing to us is getting us in trouble in the airplane. And by eliminating it, we're expecting them to work, come back, you know, miraculous healing of the instruments to take place. It's not going to happen. And by eliminating that from your scan altogether, it forces you to go in to this better partial panel scan. Please remember that. If you've got those little suction cup things and a training, don't put them in your bag in the back. Have them accessible. If you end up in a situation you've lost everything, you know, you can't, you don't have post-it notes or something, a dollar bill folded in half will slam into those round gauges and block them really well. Now, I know in general aviation it's hard to have more than one one dollar bill on you at one time, but uh, you tear one in half if you have to and put it in there. So please remember there's always a way to cover that thing up and make it work so that we can be careful. Let me go back to this Albuquerque incident. Uh, I heard reactions from you to the air traffic controller. We have to remember, folks, that it, less than 10% of air traffic controllers on average across the country happen to be pilots. And I'll tell you one thing, you can go in an ATC facility and they'll speak a different language than, they, than we do sometimes. They have terminology we don't use. In the pilot community, we've got terminology they don't use. It's just becoming financially impossible to put all the air traffic controllers through the equivalent of a private pilot ground school to get them all comfortable with all our terms. So remember that, and remember that sometimes you have to be very specific. Now this controller gets criticized, and by the way, she was devastated over this accident, over what happened to this pilot. But I can tell you this, that what happened was a severe breakdown in communication. You know what? This controller didn't understand the significance of the terminology 
I've had a vacuum pump failure. That's obvious. Didn't know that. But there is one thing that that controller is trained for. There's another thing that we're trained for is pilots. That both of them were put into play. They could have substantially increased the chances of this pilot surviving this incident. And that's what. What did that pilot not do? <clears throat> oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that. Folks, please don't ever hesitate to declare an emergency. We just had an emergency seminar here, our previous one here at Sun and Fun. And I tell you, it is just scary to me. In one particular area of the country, I remember going there right after I started doing seminars for the AOPA Air Safety Foundation. And I went to, in Indiana, I went to this town, and I mentioned it was a two-part seminar. And I, just before the break, I said, we're going to be talking about emergencies after the break. Four or five guys came walking up to the room. Neither one of them heard what the other one asked me. And all of them asked me the same question. You're going to talk about emergencies after the break? I said, yes. said, would you please cover for us when we declare the emergency and what's the repercussions we suffer if we do? Now, put, a light, put yourself in my position. If you were there doing that and it was just that town that that happened in, wouldn't a light bulb go off that some, what's going on here? Come to find out that there was a local guy who volunteered to do a, a, a safety seminar for the FAA there. And they weren't there that night, but flyers went out. They had a huge packed audience of a broad range of pilots with experience, different experience levels. And this guy stood in front of that group and he told them that the last thing he would ever do in an airplane is declare an emergency. He said, I'm just not going to open up my logbooks to be investigated by the FAA because I use that E word. I'm going to do everything I can first to handle the emergency myself, and then and only then will I declare the emergency. The guy told me that during the break. The FAA guy, came, safety program manager during that time, came and told me, I was afraid this was going to happen. He told me the story. So I came back after the break. I referred to that. I said, I, I don't ever, folks, ever want to be disagreeable with a fellow aviator. But I told that group tonight, what you heard during that seminar could literally be dead wrong. Don't ever hesitate. I don't know where this is coming from. First of all, this thing that you're going to get in trouble for declaring emergency is bunk. You know what? A lot of pilots who've gotten in trouble, it wasn't for declaring the emergency. It was for the situation they got themselves in that put other pilots at risk. It was never for declaring the emergency. Don't ever hesitate to ask for help. In fact, in fact the longer you wait, the more difficult it's going to be because what happens? Human nature comes to work. Imagine you get home from sun and fun. And you got a letter in your mailbox from the IRS. And it says, hey, we've been investigating your taxes from 2003, a couple years back. We found some serious, potentially criminal violations on your return. However, because of it being tax season, we ask you not to contact our office to discuss this matter until June 1st. Man, what's going to happen to you between now and June 1st? You're going to go crazy worrying. What are they talking about? What's going on here? You want to put the fire out. The earlier you can put the fire out, the better you're going to handle the problem. Same thing can happen to you in the airplane. You're going to build up in your mind worst case scenarios that will make the emergency worse than it actually is. The sooner you ask for help, the more options you give for air traffic control to help you, and the easier it is for you to relax because you have an advocate with you, working with you, trying to make things better. So don't ever hesitate to use the E word. And, but it's just amazing to me how that happens. Mentioned last seminar, you know, we got a saying in North Carolina. I'd rather be tried by 12 than carried by 6. So even if you got in trouble for declaring the emergency, so what? It's better to get the help and survive than try to avoid. Number one, I haven't met a single pilot. I travel, I've been in every state in this union, including Alaska and Hawaii doing seminars. I've never met one pilot that got in trouble for declaring an emergency. Not one. So don't ever hesitate to do that. Working with air traffic control, you know, one thing this pilot could have done too is specific with this controller about what he needed. I need no gyro vectors, right? They were giving him frequency changes. You've been in the vertigon out here? You know, experienced spatial disorientation? It's a scary thing. Asking and telling the controllers exactly what you need. And weather deviations. 
to get avoid getting that situation in the first place. By asking the proper questions, you can help from getting in trouble as well, right? Ask them, what precipitation levels are you painting? Not just on the air traffic control radar, but also the big boys. You, might, you can't put a big weather radar in the Cessna 152, but I tell you what, by asking the right questions, you can take advantage of the people who do have the good weather avoidance equipment. Another good question is, where are the successful deviators going to get around this mess? That helps too, doesn't it? What kind of ride are they getting? Folks, if somebody in a 777 is reporting severe turbulence and you're in a 172, I wouldn't want to go there. So it's just you know, asking these power questions can keep you from getting in trouble. You know, it's funny. Working with air traffic control, they get, they get a bad rap. And I know I hate this. I just did a column in the Southern Aviator of this month's edition that's out at the General Aviation News booth over there about this thing, about this love-hate relationship with air traffic control. And they really are good folks. I mean, you know, it, it, they, we have issues, and, but we want to work together now more than ever in resolving these things so we can all get around. And you, we think the air traffic controllers are out to get us, and we get mad at them, they get mad at us. We've all got stories about air traffic control. I, I can tell you right now, though, that if you've ever been frustrated with air traffic control, I can have you relax right now because I got them back for all of us. I'll tell you I have I was indirectly involved in a runway incursion incident at Raleigh-Durham Airport. Now, when I was flying traffic watch, I didn't fly to Raleigh-Durham. I had to fly over a general aviation field that was nearby because I needed to get out quickly and back in quickly, so I didn't want to get tied up in the system. I rarely talked to the air traffic controllers in Raleigh. They gave me my own transponder code. And unless I needed to get within five miles of RDU, I had the freedom to fly at a particular altitude all over the triangle area to do my work as a traffic pilot and reporter. So I had pretty neat. But occasionally, I have to go into the Raleigh-Durham Airport, and uh, mainly when the engineers wanted to work on the broadcast equipment that was inside the airplane. And that was the scenario this day. Now, to make matters worse, remember I was in the air at 6 o'clock in the morning. The new controllers came on and cha changed shift at 7 o'clock. So Lyon would listen to the radio station I worked on on their way to the tower. Now, on this particular morning, they picked on me more than usual. They always picked on me. They'd go, let's go up to... Sky 1015, get update on traffic, sitting on top of a Charlotte phone book to see over the instrument panel, here's Mark, you know, and that was the kind of introduction I get. But on this day, we had a guy in the studio as a guest. You've heard of Richard Simmons? Richard was there. Now, I don't have, Richard knows I tell this story. He's a friend. I've worked with him. In fact, when he comes to Raleigh on occasion, he asks me to be the one to introduce him. But he was giving me up the road that day, picking on me a lot. And Richard's an amazing guy. In fact, the Raleigh News Observer did a story on Richard Simmons, and they called me up and said, you've had to work with him a lot. And said, what's he like? And I didn't hesitate, telling the truth. He's a gerbil on acid, you know. <laughs> and this guy is wound up constantly. But he was on the air. So the controllers are listening to this, coming to the tower that morning. That was the day I had to pop up on the tower frequency. I didn't even have to have call approach control. My call sign with Raleigh Tower was Sky Patrol 1. Popped up, Sky Patrol 1, this uh, Raleigh Tower, Sky Patrol 1, need to come in and land this morning. After hearing all this, they decided they wanted to get in on the act. Morning, Sky Patrol 1, you're cleared to land on runway 32, and no offense, little buddy, but hold short, runway 5 right. <laughs> and I'm glad I took the high right. I said, all right, hold short, 5 right. When I crossed over the active runway, the ground controller got in. Folks, I'm not making this up. This is completely true stuff. I get on the other side of the runway, the ground controller says, Hey, good morning, Sky Patrol 1. If you can reach the rudder pedals, you can taxi to the ramp. <laughs> I said, to the ramp, Sky Patrol 1. I get up, folks. I couldn't have asked for this. What they didn't know, or I didn't know at the time, on the other side of the airport, somebody had left the brakes off of a heavy transport aircraft. I don't want to mention the name of the company, but when you send something and it absolutely positively has to be there overnight, <laughs> you use these people. And so they left, and this heavy rolled out into an active taxiway. Now, one of the controllers said after the fact, he said, Mark, when that thing, I saw a line guy running, if he'd have caught up with it, what would he have done? <laughs> I said, I don't know, it's a big company, he may have sacrificed himself by becoming a human chalk, I don't know. But this was the clincher of this. I'm not kidding. This happened two weeks to the day after the FAA officially announced their runway safety office. 
Now, you know how it is. You got a new job, all these people coming up. What happened? Well, they want to investigate. They've had an active taxiway incursion at the Raleigh Durham Airport, Class Charlie Airspace over there. We need to go investigate. Hopped on the airplane, fly down to Raleigh, get in the tower to investigate. What's the first thing they did? Listen to the tapes <laughs> <laughs> of the pilot controller communications that were going on at the time. They were written up for non standard phraseology with a pilot. <laughs> I'd see them in town, I'd say, oh, I got y'all back, I didn't have to do nothing, you know. <laughs> and they got all mad at me. And I do have to warn you, as your official instructor here today, though, that all of us have funny ATC stories. Please don't tell them in the town where you live. <laughs> they will give you, you know, get you back. Because I told this at our North Carolina Wings weekend, I was a banquet speaker that night, and our little airport, we had set up a temporary tower for this Wings weekend, and the controllers were from Raleigh Tower. And I'm telling the story, and they're sitting in the back, you know, that's okay, that's funny. <laughs> Two weeks later, I had to go to Charlotte from Raleigh. Char Raleigh to Nor North Carolina. Charlotte, North Carolina for a broadcast meeting. And it was 800 overcast. So I just filed him a little 152. The RCO at the Johnston County Airport where I was based is run by Raleigh. So I pop up on the you know, frequency there and I said, Hey, Raleigh, this is Sky Patrol 1. ready to pick up my FR to Charlotte. And I heard, Good morning, Sky Patrol 1. Stand by to copy your amended clearance. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, folks. He said, Sky Patrol 1, you're cleared to Charlotte via Denver. <laughs> he said, Columbia, that's not the city, that's the country. <laughs> and direct Charlotte. I said, I accept my new clearance. However, I need to amend drastically my estimated arrival time <laughs> at that airport. So, folks, the bottom line is they're there to help us. And you got, just got to talk to them. Don't be willing to communicate. One of the big complaints we hear, not only from uh, other pilots, but uh, air traffic control is pilot, we don't listen sometimes before we talk. And that slows down the process of communication. Try to remember when you speak their language and referencing where you are to a local fix, one that appears on their scope. Make deviation requests, pardon me, as early as you possibly can. Know what you cannot accept. Unable is a powerful word if you're ever uncomfortable in the airplane. Air traffic controllers don't get mad at me telling you this because I, we've worked with, we've been doing this seminar all over the country called Say It Right, working with NATCA and working with air traffic controllers. And they agree, folks, if we goof up in an airplane, who dies? We do. If an air traffic controller goofs up, who's going home to dinner that night? They are. So we've got to stay ahead of the game and realize that human errors occur in the cockpit and at ATC as well, especially if you're in the busy environment of a single pilot IFR operation. Our next key is to have the right stuff attitude. This is really important. That proficient IFR pilot has attitudes, not the aircraft, but theirs. You don't take problems with you when you fly anytime, especially in the IFR environment. We may think when we're in, I've thought this before, you get up in the, in the sky and you say, man, when I fly, all my troubles seem to go away. The key to that is seem to. They really don't. You know that those problems compromise your ability to handle emergencies and think close carefully. You know you shouldn't fly sick or when you're tired as well. Your reaction time goes down. Those last busiest times of the flight, when you're trying to shoot an approach into an airport, when you're most taxed, isn't it human nature, Murphy's Law at work, that that's when you're more likely to be tired? So be careful. Plan everything. Your pre-flight planning should, should cons consider how fatigued you can be. Making a four-hour flight in beautiful VFR conditions is less taxing than a 45-minute flight of hard IFR when the winds are messing with you, aren't they? We need to remember that. Plus, that proficient pilot does that soul-searching to know what you, your weak areas are so you're willing to get help so when you, when you need it in the form of that good training. So single pilot IFR, let's go back to that question I asked you before. After seeing this today, is it safe? Is it safe? Could be. I like that answer. It could be if you have the right attitude about it. If you're willing to remember that you're going to react the way you're trained. If you're willing to do instrument proficiency checks rather than knocking out you know, just routine shooting approaches every six months to stay with that. So please keep that in mind so that we can be a whole lot safer when we're flying. You know what? I want to talk to you just in the 
last couple of minutes. This is our last presence here at the um, at Sunday Fund, and, and get off some of the tough training part and talk to you a little bit about another part to aviation we need to address. And we've heard a lot. You know, our the president of AOPA, Phil Boyer, has been all over the place doing. Uh, programs talk about user fees and those kinds of things and I know it's important that we get involved now I don't want to get political up here at all today but I do want to tell you this that I think that just personally that we're missing out on golden opportunities in many cases to tell people the good things that general aviation does because they're missing out they see I, I spent 22 years in the broadcast business and I know, so I can talk about them a little bit. And I've got good friends that are still in it. And I get so frustrated to watch them cover an aviation incident on television. Don't you? And so what's happening here? The public is getting a very skewed version of aviation, aren't they? They're seeing this worst case scenario. Mentioned in the last seminar about this thing about the, uh, the incident at the, um, with the Washington Aegis incursion. Remember that? And how poorly that boy scared people half to death. And yet, it was two pilots who admittedly goofed up with that. So let's talk, how can we keep this from getting out of hand? We've got to counteract all the negative publicity by telling them the good news. First thing we've got to do is we have got, whether it's IFR, VFR, ultralights, or a triple seven, we've got to fly safely. Anytime we goof up in an aircraft, it's sending general aviation naysayers just this fan mail about how unsafe it is. The other thing we've got to do, folks, is tell them the good news. Participate in Young Eagles program. Take kids flying. Tell them about programs like Angel Flight. They're here. Tell them about the good things that aviation does. I was down in, in Texas, in Austin, Texas, a year or so ago, my time frame of when this was is messed up. It was one of the hurricanes came up the Gulf Coast and messed up New Orleans. And I was there just after those hurricanes hit. And Austin was a little bit of turmoil. They were bringing a lot of people in. I was there to do a seminar. And the president of the Texas Aviation Association called me on my cell phone. He said, Mark, can we give a presentation here tonight? And I said, sure, what for? Just curious. And you're welcome to. But he said, we want to give an award to a couple and he told me the story of Bob and Deanne Gloris. Bob is an aircraft mechanic. He flies as a hobby, but he makes his living working on airplanes. His wife, Deanne, is not a pilot, not a mechanic, but she's married to one. She kind of keeps books for him at their shop. They're based at a little airport north of Austin, Texas. And um, they're just a really neat couple. And they're pretty busy working on airplanes at that airport, as you can imagine. But when those hurricanes came up and tore up the Gulf Coast region, Deanne Gloris, sitting in the welcoming center to their shop, heard pilots coming there very frustrated. They were trying to go help. They had one instance of a pilot who said, you know what, we were trying to get down there to, this, to make a, an angel flight, a medical flight for a kid, and en route we filed, and on the way down there, the controllers came on the frequency, and they sounded confused. They said, we just got contacted from FEMA that their airport's closed. And then the pilot and the controllers both got discussing what power do they have to close the airport if it's not damaged. I'm supposed to go help. This pilot ended up saying, well, I guess I better not take the risk of losing my license for 60 days and not being able to fly these missions at all. So he turned around, came back to the airport in Austin. Deanne, hearing this story and others, decided we need to help. She got on the telephone. First thing she did was call a radio station in Austin, Texas. We need some stuff to carry to these people. I don't know how we're going to do this, but we know a lot of pilots, and they're going to help. Guarantee it. Folks in Austin, you wouldn't believe the response. They filled up their hangar with all kinds of stuff to give those folks. And then they put the word out to the Texas Aviation Association website, we need help. Folks, when I got down there, they were a week, almost two weeks into that program. And you volunteer general aviation pilots in what the public calls our little airplanes have flown tons, 17 tons of relief supplies to the hurricane victims in the Gulf Coast. Where was that in the news? I called friends of mine, still in the media, and couldn't give them to cover that story. So we, if we tell it ourselves to our friends, neighbors, civic clubs, wherever we get the chance, they might believe us in a little more, don't you think? 
I hope so. You may think, well, in the big scheme of things, does grassroots work? Yes, it does. In fact, let me tell you. I'll tell you a story before I leave you here today. In 1940, the British government, through the British press, then just BBC Radio, and newspapers in Britain, told the British people this. Folks, we've goofed. We severely underestimated the presence of the en enemy army coming into a place called Dunkirk. Why were they telling the British people this? They were actually preparing the mothers and families of these young men that these guys might not be coming home. Now, look at the, because they, they said we're overtaxed, we don't have the resources to get these guys out of Dunkirk or to get help to them. What did the British people do? Folks, what happened next is an amazing human character story. The British people got in anything that floated. And the captain, listen to this, the captains of these vessels ranged in age from 14 years old up. And they went down there and rescued 300,000 British troops and associated Allied soldiers. The most successful rescue mission in history, and the government had very little to do with it. The British authorities did seize a few ships for these volunteer captains to take down there, but mainly the people did it. Folks, if we have it within us to do something as amazing as this, can't we do something simple as change the public perception of general aviation? If they can pull this off. Yes, we can. I believe, I'm totally convinced of it. Because of all these people that are fighting in every war that this country has been associated with, what are we fighting for? Freedom. Freedom to fly these little airplanes and have these freedoms that we have now. I was in Austin, Texas exactly a uh, year before, and I got there after Veterans Day, and this picture was in the, uh, in, the, in the Houston newspaper. That's Houston James on his left. Houston's named after his hometown of Houston, Texas. He, like my late father, a Pearl Harbor survivor. The guy on the right, Sergeant Mark Gronke, it's easy to see, he left his, lost his left arm. It's more difficult to see he lost his left eye, and his left leg isn't there either, lost it in Iraq. These people are fighting for our freedoms, and we've got to be willing to do our part by flying safely, by flying friendly, because people are watching us. If they meet you, they think all pilots are like you, so let's be the good guys and put on that white hat and become goodwill ambassador for general aviation. You folks have a great deal of character to sit in here today on a beautiful day like this, and those of you sitting at home watching on the computer, on the Internet, what character do you have to sit in on a safety seminar Name another aspect of society that actually sits there and goes to a safety seminar voluntarily. General aviation pilots do that all the time. We see them by the thousands where we're on the road for the AOPA Air Safety Foundation. We appreciate you being here. Hope you enjoy the rest of your visit to Sun and Fun. And remember, let's be nice out there because people are watching us. It could be our freedom to fly. Thank you for coming. Hope you enjoy the rest of the Sun and Fun. Don't forget to fill out your registration cards in the back. I'll be glad to collect those and, um, and, and take it back. Those of you online, you can get a certificate for watching the seminar as well by going to asf.org on the Internet. Take one of our online courses. It satisfies the requirements of the FAA WINGS program. Thanks a lot.